Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our Introduction to the Bible course. And today you can see I've moved from campus out to Glendale, Arizona, home of the Fiesta Bowl football game, which was played yesterday. I was watching it on TV while I was working out and it reminded me of my trip to this game eight years ago. I can't believe it was that long ago. Incidentally, this was a game that saw the very rare one point safety. But that's beside the point. You'll have to go look that up at some other point. Today, we're going to build on what we talked about in our last class. Last class, we did a quick survey of these nine documents from the church's history, and we also identified five core teachings that emerge organically from the church's teaching. These five core teachings are hardly controversial. Pretty much any Catholic biblical scholar will sign on to them. Today, we're going to move to what I call my five animating convictions. These are choices I've made, conclusions I've drawn as a scholar that guide me in how I study the Bible. Some Catholic scholars might well disagree or would demur at least to some extent, and that should be considered normal. After all, scholars disagree for all sorts of reasons. The principal three you can see on your screen. Sometimes scholars simply don't agree on what it is we think we're doing. We disagree philosophically on what it means to study the Bible. Sometimes, however, we agree on what it is we think we're doing, but we disagree on what tools we find helpful in this endeavor. We have a methodological disagreement. We argue over which methods are most fruitful for studying the Bible. And then finally, even if we use the same methods and we unearth lots of evidence that we can all agree on, sometimes we simply disagree on how that evidence weighs for or against a conclusion. Much as a jury sometimes has to struggle over whether to convict or acquit, or find liable or not liable, we have the same kinds of questions that arise in scholarship. Sometimes we just don't know how to evaluate the evidence assembled by our tools. So I want to present to you now these five animating convictions and at least a little bit of a sense of why I draw them. The first animating conviction we could call equal inspiration. Since inspiration is the charism by which the text has God as its author and God's authorship does not admit of degrees, all scripture is equally inspired. This flows organically from what Vatican II said and even what Vatican I said before then. You can see the text is very clear. The biblical books have God as their author. There's no debate about this point. However, I would argue we can draw from that principle the following four corollaries. The first is a line I borrow from a book I like, but I hear it from a lot of exegetes, and that is that choice implies meaning. When we're reading even a single sentence in the Bible, simply looking at that one sentence, we can realize it could have been said any number of ways. The author chose a specific way. That choice, even if made without a lot of thought, implies meaning. Second, the Bible is not a mine shaft out of which a lot of raw materials come, where a worker has to determine useful versus not useful. Rather, it's all the voice of the Holy Spirit. We are not free to discard parts we don't like. We're not free to discard parts we find difficult to understand or inconvenient. We have to interpret the whole. Flowing from that, arbitrary preferences are invalid. It is not legitimate to claim, well, the Gospel of Matthew says one thing, but I think John knew Jesus better than Matthew, so therefore I'm going to prefer John over Matthew invalid. Indeed, it's invalid to presume that the Gospels are more authoritative than the letters, or that the Pentateuch is more authoritative than the prophets. No, no, no. While some books have, over the course of the church's tradition, become more central, certainly Vatican II describes the unique role of the Gospels in the biblical canon, the difference is not one of inspiration. It's one more of centrality. And finally, harmonization is inherently suspicious. I'm not saying we can't connect different books of the Bible talking about a single event. But I'm always a little suspicious of the too easy solution or the too convenient solution. It is very easy to take the four Gospels, for example, and craft a fifth Gospel that none of the four would recognize, simply to make things simple. We move on to conviction number two. All the text is inspired, but only the text is inspired. While the Holy Spirit acts in other ways in the church's life, these ways are qualitatively different than the inspired text. Therefore, the following things are not inspired. Chapter and verse divisions were added centuries after the texts were written. Paragraph and stanza breaks 
are matters determined by the editors of translations and even original language editions. Subheadings in the text, textual and translational and grammatical and syntactical choices, all of these things are made up by contemporary authors. Even the limits in the text, that is where a given passage begins and ends, is something that someone more recently has determined. And even what we often call the habitual interpretation or the well-worn interpretations, these interpretations that parents have been telling their kids and clergy have been sharing with their congregations for years, just because they've been repeated for a long time, that mere fact does not make them accurate. So we should be mindful of that. Conviction number three, returning to the question of methodology and tools. Any tool useful for illuminating the text may be used to draw valid inferences about the text, including both diachronic and synchronic approaches. What are diachronic and synchronic approaches? A diachronic approach, coming from the Greek meaning through time, explores how the text evolved or developed over time. We call diachronic analysis the historical critical method. Synchronic analysis, by contrast, comes from the Greek with time and analyzes, considers as a given, the final form of the text. It's not interested in how it evolved. It's only concerned with what is the final form. This comprises more literary approaches, think narrative analysis and rhetorical analysis. We'll talk about these a little later on in the course. Both of these approaches are helpful. Indeed, the Pontifical Biblical Commission said in 1993 that we need to include both. You'll see in the blue, it talks about the value of, of synchronic analysis, but in the green, it talks about how diachronic study, the historical critical method, remains indispensable. Indeed, Pope Benedict said as much as well in Verbum Domini in 2010. You'll notice in the brown and red, however, the limitations of each approach. In the brown, it talks about the limitations of the diachronic approach, while in the red, it talks about the limitations of synchronic approaches. We need to bear those in mind. That's what the church is asking us to do. Let's move to our last two animating convictions. Number four, the book is fundamental. That is, the fundamental unit of interpretation is the biblical book. Not the chapter, not the pericope, not the hypothetical earlier source, but the biblical book in its final form. All other levels must be justified based on valid inferences in the text. Why? Because either Israel, in the case of the Old Testament, or the church in the case of the New, came to recognize this book in its final form as authoritative. We have to defer to that choice. As a result, we have to begin with the Gospel of Mark, not that Sunday Gospel you're hearing this upcoming week. It's an important methodological and conceptual framework. And then animating conviction number five, the parts of the Bible are not severable. What do I mean by that? I mean that no part of a biblical book, or for that matter, any part of the biblical canon, can be severed from any of its contexts, historical, literary, or geographical. It means we can't proof text. It means that we must consider the Bible as part of a whole. Moreover, we can't judge the truth or falsity of anything in the Bible apart from any of these contexts. We can't just take one sentence and apply a true or false judgment to it. We have to interpret that sentence within the context of the larger book. You can see here, the church has weighed in on some of these things. The interpretation of the Bible in the church in 1993 said, although each book of the Bible was written with its own particular end in view and has its own specific meaning, it takes on a deeper meaning when it becomes part of the canon as a whole. Pope Benedict also reflected on this problem of the one and the many in the Bible in paragraphs 39 and 40 of his uh, post synodal apostolic exhortation. You can see we have a lot to continue to investigate. In our next class, we'll look at the biblical canon in greater detail. Until then, read well and pray well.